Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this next episode of Back Garden Biology. It's the Easter weekend and it's almost eerily quiet around here because even the builders two doors down have stopped. Uh, this episode is going to be about bumblebees. They're one of the real favourite insects that people enjoy watching and we know that they're always doing something good. They're visiting our flowers, pollinating them, uh, so we have a very positive image of them. And lots of people want to do more for bumblebees and try to, to plant the kind of flowers that they like to come and visit and provide the kind of homes that they like to come and live in. At the moment, in my garden, most of the buzzing that I can hear around me isn't coming from bumblebees. The most noisy insects at the moment are the hairy-footed flower bees. They're not a true bumblebee, they're what's called a solitary bee, and you can find both males and females of those buzzing around at the moment. They have a slightly high-pitched buzz, and every now and then we get the kind of bass note of a bumblebee going past, and we are seeing them, but they're very, very difficult to film, because what those bumblebees are are queen bumblebees coming out of hibernation and they're big and they're glossy and they're going around and they're looking mostly for nest sites and they're very difficult to film because although they look large and ungainly and not like they ought to be able to fly very well in fact they can fly very well indeed and they go whizzing around quartering the ground in an area like this and they're looking to see where can they build a nest and particularly what they're looking for is old mouse nests uh, which make very good places for those bumblebee queens to found their colonies. So I'm going to do a little guide to some of the common queen bumblebees that I'm seeing in my garden right now. And you're probably seeing the same species. There may be one or two additional ones, depending on exactly where you live. But before we start that, I'm going to challenge you. Get a piece of paper, get a pencil, and see if you can sketch a bee, and see if you can get the main parts right and then pause this video for a second while you do that, and then you can press play again and see whether you got it right. Okay, so here are the main parts of a bee that you should have included on your diagram. The key thing when you're drawing any insect is to realise that it has three main body parts. So I'm drawing the head in now, which has eyes, a tongue, and some antennae. And then behind that is the thorax, and then the bit at the end is the abdomen, okay? So all insects have this basic structure, this basic three-part structure, head, thorax, abdomen. Ancestrally, the ancestral insect probably had a lot more segments and they would have been a lot more similar. So the thorax is actually made up of three segments that have been have sort of been cemented together over evolutionary time, so they look like a single segment now. And if you've drawn legs and wings, and I hope you have, they should all be coming off the thorax. None should be coming off the abdomen. Now, a bee is obviously an insect, but it also belongs to a bigger group called the arthropods. Arthropods are characterised by these jointed legs, and all insects have six legs, three pairs of legs, uh, all coming off the thorax, one from each of those ancestral segments. So I'm going to just draw the legs in on one side. Because the other thing that's characteristic of most insects, although some have lost them, are wings. So they have two pairs of wings. And they've been modified a lot in different insect groups, but in the bees, they always have two proper wings. The first pair is normally the largest, the second pair is smaller, and they are actually kind of zipped together. There's a little series of hooks between the front and the hind wing that keeps it almost functioning as a single wing. When bees land, they often fold these right back actually over the body. So that's often where you see them and they snap them out, whiz them up before they fly off. So that's a basic bee structure. Okay, so what about some different common species of bumblebee? 
Well, they're not that easy to recognise. So I'm going to show you three that I think are quite easy to recognise, at least when the queens are around, which is at this time of year. And of course, I've got my trusty Play-Doh out. So the common carder bee is a ginger bee, an all ginger bee. So that means it has a gingery coloured thorax and a gingery coloured abdomen. And sometimes the abdomen is darker, it's streaked with black or blackish, but it always has a uniformly um, coloured abdomen. It never has a separate colour on the tip of the tail. And that distinguishes it from the tree bumblebee, because they also have a gingery thorax. And the abdomen is really black though, not really any hint of ginger at all. And at the end, a very clear white tip. This is a newcomer to the UK. It's flown in from continental Europe in the last 10 to 20 years. And it's established itself very successfully. And it doesn't seem to have had any negative impacts on any of our other bees. So it's to be welcomed. And you sometimes see nests in old nest boxes or high up. There was one in my next door neighbour's garden, which they'd made it inside a sort of pergola. And we used to see them coming and going. So that's the tree bumblebee. And then another one that's easy to recognise, when it's the queens anyway, is the all black red tailed bumblebee. So she's got a black thorax, a black abdomen with a very clear red tip. We've got a beautiful huge one flying around our garden at the moment, but I cannot get her on film because she's remarkably agile. So there's three common easy bumblebees. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on, none of those look like bumblebees to me. Surely bumblebees are supposed to be black and yellow striped. Well, those three are all quite common and they don't have any black and yellow stripes. But of course, other bumblebees do. So here are a couple of common yellow and black striped bumblebees. And they've got very similar names, as you see. They're called the white-tailed bumblebee and the buff-tailed bumblebee. And again, these are what the queens look like. So the white-tailed bumblebee, the thorax has one yellow stripe at the top. So it's a black thorax with a yellow stripe at the top. The abdomen has one yellow stripe quite high up and then they have a clear white tail. The buff-tailed bumblebee is almost exactly the same. Also has a black thorax with a yellow stripe at the front and the abdomen also has one yellow stripe but then the tail is a buff colour. And it's only now when they're queens that you can actually tell these two apart. Once they start producing workers, then they'll all have white tails and you'll have no hope of telling them apart. You may notice in your garden another stripy black and yellow bee who has an extra stripe. So at this time of year, another queen who has a yellow stripe here as well. That's the garden bumblebee. So there are actually at least three common black and yellow striped bumblebees in addition to these others that we see here. So you may think a bumblebee is just a bumblebee, but you know, that's nature for you. We always have a lot of diversity and different species and now's a great time to look out for them. Try and grab a picture as they fly past of the queens as they are searching for nest sites and feeding their first brood of workers. Our usual footage of us trying to take pictures of queen bumblebees looks like this. You can see the bees are flying around very actively. They don't settle. They're looking around the base of trees. They're looking under bricks in vegetation. They're looking for nest sites, not for nectar. But sometimes they do stop and feed. And here is that same queen falling out of a fritillary flower. Uh, she is heavy and the inside of the petals are slippery. And there she goes again. She also needs a bit of practice. Freeze frame, we see two yellow stripes and a clean white tail. So this is the queen of the white-tailed bumblebee. For contrast, here is a still picture of the buff-tailed bumblebee. You see the tail not clean white, but a sort of dirty yellowish colour. And finally, here's the other black and yellow with three yellow stripes and a white tail. That's the garden bumblebee, taken by my uncle. And finally, we managed to get some decent footage of this queen common carder bee. She's got a lovely gingery thorax and quite a gingery abdomen, uh, certainly with no white tail. So that's the common carder bee queen. So let's think about the life cycle of the bumblebees. Uh, they all have a pretty similar life cycle. 
They have come out now from hibernation in the spring and they're looking to found their colonies. They're not looking for mates, they already did that. They found a male at the end of last summer before they went into hibernation and they can store that sperm all the way through the winter and use it now in their new colonies. Now what they're doing, as I said, the first generation they're going to rear is the first generation of workers and they'll have to brood that generation themselves and feed them. But as soon as those workers emerge and can go off and forage for themselves the queens will no longer leave the colony they'll stay there laying eggs and producing more workers and sort of ordering the others around and the workers will be going off and foraging and that's when you start to see a lot more bumblebees you'll see the populations really building up through the summer now bumblebees have a or, or all bees belong to a group called the hymenoptera and that's the bees ants and wasps and they have some really strange uh, mechanisms for determining sex so at the end of the summer once the colonies become very large the colonies will switch the females will switch to producing the males and the new queens so everything will change they'll stop producing workers and they'll produce the new queens and the males so how do they do that so one way they do that is through the sex determination mechanism so remember we said with the fritillaries that for most sexual organisms you have two copies of the of the instruction manual inside your genome and we call that being diploid so we are diploid organisms and when we want to make new offspring we have to first of all separate the two copies into one so for an egg cell or a sperm cell only gets one copy of the manual and then when egg and sperm cell fuse we restore the diploid number now in ants bees and wasps something really strange happens so if the female simply lays an, an egg which is unfertilized and only has a single copy of the manual that will develop into a male but if the egg is fertilized and it's a diploid um, embryo then it will become a female and that's unique to that group it's a really strange system and we call them haplodiploid because the males are haploid and the females are diploid now the workers are all female and so are the new queens so how does that work out how do you decide whether you're going to become a worker or a queen and that is under the control of the queen so she releases chemicals inside the nest that suppress the ovaries of the worker females which means that they can't have offspring of their own and if that starts to break down and it often does at the end of the summer then all hell can break loose in the colony and the workers can start trying to rear their own offspring and that does happen so the bumblebees seem like this very calm and ordered system but actually there's quite a lot of tension and conflict within the colony and that starts to emerge as the season goes on well we've spent the last week chasing after these queen bumblebees and we've really found it hard to get some of them on film We've, we've really noticed that the carder bee, that gingery bee, that's the one that's really quite friendly and will let you approach. The others are much more difficult. I'm not sure whether it's because they're still really actively looking for nests so they won't settle anywhere or whether they just are actually very skittish. So we're sort of frightened of bees, but it seems like they're pretty frightened of us. So if you're, having, if you're trying to get some photographs of queen bees, I hope you have a better job than I managed. Anyway, until next time, that's the end of this episode, so happy hunting for queen bees. And we've found a bit of a casualty here. This is a queen of, I think, the buff-tailed bumblebee. And she is in the grass there, and she's quite cross about something, and now I've made her rather irate. Oh, it's all right. I don't think we'll be able to use that.